when you speak to, if you'll put this on okay. for recording purposes and people online. Okay. I see. You don't have to yet. Just whenever, uh -huh. when you start, you don't have to right now. No. So do they see, see the screen or me? They see you and the screen, but okay. online. Mm -hmm. Test, 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 one, two. Test. Test, one, two, that's why. Test, one, two, test. Test, one, two, test, one, two. Big one, yes. forward and back, yep, and then the top one. See that? Yep. You get the idea. I point at the screen. Yeah, you point at the screen. <laughs>
the little microphones don't work terribly well, so I'll have my microphone. I'll try to pass around if people have questions. But if, if they speak before I get there, if you can repeat their question or you know, interpret it so that the people online will hear what the question was. Um, and this microphone um, you need to use just because that's really how many the online people hear well. So, um, too much noise in their rooms, which hasn't happened yet. I'll have to come up and use this control panel over here to turn them off. So I'll, I'll do that. So if I come up and do that, don't try to interfere in any other way. Yeah. Good morning. Yeah. Oh, no problem. Are you good then? Yes, thank you. Your yeah, jeans not kind of like top notch. So okay. if you need anything, I'm I'm listening and everything. But if okay. for some reason I don't respond, okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and
quite a bit of detail. So there are two students for the session Good morning. Um, before we get started, um, so Jean's under the weather today, so if there are any administrative problems about the course, please let me know during the break. Um, I have another appointment at 5 after 10, so I'll be leaving pretty promptly at the end of the second hour. So if you have any issues with anything, please let me know during the mid-break. Um, and today starts the um, participation in the IRB sessions, and I understand there were some issues about the paperwork for signing up for that not being ready yet, so I know people who are participating this week will have to leave a little bit early to get that taken care of. Um, if you have any problems really making it happen, again, please let me know and we'll work to make sure that it all goes smoothly in the future. Um, so this morning we have two different topics that all relate to um, the interaction between the research teams and their patient populations from the first from the perspective of bioethical issues and second from more how to interate, interact effectively with the population for um, recruitment, retention, and all of those kind of issues. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Mariko Nakano, and Dr. Nakano got her um, training at Kyoto University. She got a PhD in ethics and came to UAB a little less than two years ago. Or, yeah. um, and that really marked a time for infusing more ethics training in our medical school curriculum. Um, she participates in um, helping to infuse ethical discussions throughout the medical school training um, in case discussions as well as small group discussions and all through the um, process, but she's also gotten very involved in research uh, ethics and is co-director of the um, ethics working group in the Alabama Genomic Health Initiative. And I think we've talked a little bit about that initiative already. She'll refer to it during her talk, but this is really a tremendous opportunity in Alabama to um, try to learn from individuals' genetic backgrounds, how those data can be used to hopefully positively influence health outcomes. 
but it raises a lot of issues in dealing with populations about how to handle their data. So we really look forward to her discussion of population-based uh, ethical issues in genomic and uh, genetic research. Um, please, uh, if you're off-site, if you're having any trouble hearing, uh, let me know in the chat box and we'll work with the sound um, and uh, look forward to a good discussion. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Dr. Chapman. I'm Mariko Nakano from the UAD School of Medicine and I'm a PhD in Epicent Biotics. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about bioethical issues in population-based genomic and geno genetic studies and I want to discuss this from my experiences of the AGHI, the Alabama Genomic Health Initiative, which is a statewide genotyping slash genome sequencing study, which just started last year. It is funded by the state of Alabama, and it is a joint project between UAB and Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology. PI is a Dr. Bruce Cook and Dr. Matthew Might at UAB, and Dr. Greg Barsh from Hudson Alpha. And I'm serving as co-chair of its bioethics working group with Dr. Tom May from Hudson Alpha and Dr. Stephen Shodeki uh, from Tuskegee University's National Bioethics Institute. So I am not a geneticist, so excuse me if I use some terminology in a wrong manner, but I will hopefully be able to provide valuable information and insights about the ethical issues of this sort of research. So this is a speaker disclosure and disclaimer that uh, you can find on your handouts from the one, or if you don't, <laughs> I, I don't think I should just repeat this one. Now, um, this is part of the screenshot from the AGHI, uh, Alabama Genomic Health Initiative website that explains this project. Enrollment is currently down in Birmingham, but the enrollment sites will expand to uh, Huntsville, Selma, Montgomery, and possibly to Cooper Green, Tuscaloosa <coughs> this year, and more in the future. The research team plans to recruit 2,000 uh, participants per year with the goal of enrolling 10,000 participants over a total of five years. And this is the basic structure of the AGHI. We recruit two cohorts, one being healthy individuals and the other being affected individuals. So healthy individuals, healthy individual, healthy volunteers, I uh, mean people who are either healthy or are obtaining care for various types of health problems with no specific target for the study. And affected individuals, Affected individuals uh, mean people with clinical signs and symptoms that suggest an undiagnosed genetic disorder. And this cohort may contain uh, very young individuals and children. And we may uh, do the trio analysis, which include uh, parents of the affected individuals. So both, both cohorts provide a blood sample. Uh, the sample from healthy volunteers will then undergo genetic testing uh, of uh, roughly 650,000 sites in the genetic code, or SNPs, and be analyzed for very variants that are known to cause significant health problems for which there are proven effective approaches to treat or prevent the disease or improve outcomes. We call it medically actionable results. And as of now, we use ACMG59, which is the list of variants in 59 genes recommended as medically actionable by American College of Medical Genetics and Gen Genomics. The results, the ACMG59 results, will be returned to participants, and in case any medically actionable item were found, the participants will receive medical advice from genetic counselors. On the other hand, the affected cohort undergo whole genome sequencing to identify a genetic variant that explains the condition. And diagnosis, diagnostic results will be returned to the participants and genetic counseling. Will be but this is not the end of the story. In addition to this genotyping and sequencing, all participants will be requested to allow storage of biospecimens to answer um, a short medical questionnaire and to permit medical record data to be stored in the study database, such as I2B2 and m uh, Genomic data obtained by genotyping or sequencing will also be stored in m -Core. These data uh, will then be used for research on genomic contributions to health and disease and made available to outside, <laughs> investi outside investigators with IRB-approved studies. And these outside studies will also be subject to the uh, inst 
uh, internal review of the AGI, AGI steering committee. So this project has both the clinical and the research aspects. So, so this upper part, this upper part uh, has clinical importance for participants, whereas this lower part is purely about research that will hopefully advance knowledge and benefit future patients. Do you have any questions about this project? Seems clear. Okay, so it's a complicated study that requires lots of collaboration. So the AGHI team consists of multiple working groups, including a uh, patient navigator who recruits uh, and ex explains uh, uh, to the potential participants in a layperson language, and recruitment communi community engagement team working group, and communications working group, administration and bioethics working group, and biobank or bioinformatics working group, and genomics in, uh, working group, which analyzes the variants and discuss what kind of variants should be added to the list of medically actionable genes, and also education, educating the physicians, primary care physicians, and other uh, people, um, genetic counselors. And so the AGH team consists of these multiple working groups, and uh, and working group leaders up, update each other on a on a weekly basis and meet and discuss important issues on a monthly basis. So we we are a very cohesive group uh, and a large team. <coughs> Then what sort of ethical issues should we anticipate? Uh, ethical issues of genetic testing, screening, whole, genome se whole exome sequencing, and whole genome sequencing were extensively discussed by the Presidential Bioethics Commission several years ago. A very thick report entitled Privacy and Progress in Whole Genome Sequencing was issued in 2012, which, six years ago, uh, which discussed the issue of stigmatizing, privacy issues, and familial implications of whole genome sequencing. Its message was rather simple. They say progress is important, but privacy is also important. So de-identification de of the data and informed consent are the two main norms uh, they proposed. But we have actually encountered many specific issues at each step of our project. So I will explain each of them later. And ethics of genomic genetic research is important in today's context, in today's context, and especially in Alabama, here in Alabama. Uh, first of all, uh, there remains distrust in research here in Alabama. If you remember the notorious Tuskegee syphilis study, there's no wonder uh, there are still people who don't trust scientists at, at all. I think I should, Dr. Tom Hoddle uh, has brilliantly explained that sad event that led to the formation of the National Research Act of 1974. In addition to that, recent trend in bioethics should also be considered. Nowadays, we conduct more and more translational research that has both clinical and research com component, just like the AGHI. This could cause confusions um, on, the, on the part of research participants who are also patients. This may be misled, uh, they may be misled to believe that the research project they sign up will bring about huge therapeutic benefits to them when it really doesn't. This is called therapeutic misconception, <laughs> and researchers have ethical obligation to avoid that. Therapeutic misconception. That's a good point. <laughs> also, in sorry, I have a question about mm -hmm. about that. Um, what happens when during this process and you're discovered? Uh, some sort of disease or biomarker or whatever for somebody and uh, there is no cure. Mm -hmm. Hence a dilemma. Mm -hmm. Do you tell them? Would you tell them? Or what's the process? Mm -hmm. Because you identified two important uh, right. concerns mm -hmm. previous to this slide. One was privacy mm -hmm. and the other one was mm -hmm. uh, the identification of personal information. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? For whole genome sequencing control, uh, they are already affected and they're interested <laughs> in knowing uh, the, the affected individuals who will undergo whole genome sequencing are already uh, very concerned about their condition. Uh, 
and we will give them the result whenever we find. As for the uh, genotype, genotyping people uh, who are normally healthy individuals, they will receive only medically actionable results in, in our project. That's, that's uh, the conclusion we, we drew after lots of consideration. So those are the things that mm -hmm. the medical profession mm -hmm. can act on. Mm -hmm. But isn't it still an uh, ethical dilemma that if you find something mm -hmm. and you know it's no cure mm -hmm. and you don't reveal it to the person, mm -hmm. Isn't that a dilemma? Yeah, that's, that's one of the key issues that we encounter in this kind of a project. And it depends on the policy it, each project has. And we discussed this uh, somewhat extensively, and we concluded that we will only return the results. And we will clearly state that we will only return the medically action of the genes alone. Hmm? But we will get into that later. Okay. Yeah, thanks. So. So, uh, so there's a trans content. And also in research using database and biobank, there's greater concerns about how to protect patient privacy. We should also keep in mind that once genomic information itself is personal information, as we will discuss later. Also to be noted in the current trend about the ethical rule of fairness, previously, the Tuskegee syphilis study in which only male African-Americans were recruited for the study of syphilis, and for example, the Willowbrook hepatitis study in which mentally disabled pediatric inmates were used to study hepatitis. <coughs> Those two studies, uh, for example, were accused of unfair inclusion of vulnerable population. But nowadays, unfair, unfair exclusion of vulnerable population is also considered unethical uh, because those population may fail to receive benefits of medical advances by being const constantly excluded from research studies. So there's a shifted focus about fairness uh, from unfair inclusion of the vulnerable population to unfair exclusion to, uh, of uh, vulnerable population. Uh, both are now also uh, considered unethical. Now, we have regulations at the federal level, uh, such as HIPAA of 1996 and GINA. And HIPAA states that it is illegal to disclose a patient's personal health information to anyone outside the health healthcare team uh, that provides care for the patient. GINA prohibits discrimination and health coverage and employment, based health insurance coverage and employment uh, based on genetic information. These are two ways to ensure patient privacy and confidentiality. But we know these regulations won't give full protection uh, for research participants. For example, genomic information itself is personal information, as I said before, and as I will explain more fully later. We should also be aware that GINA does not cover discrimination in settings other than insurance or employment. For example, discrimination, possible discrimination in education or school choice or marriage, etc. And GINA also does not protect participants from possible discriminations in life insurance, disability insurance, or long-term care insurance, or employment, discrimination in employment at private companies with fewer than 15 employees. And also, ethics of cutting edge biotechnology may not be fully covered by existing policies and regulations. So, and we, we need to uh, think independently and critically about uh, what kind of ethical code we, we, we should uh, have. So having these recent and local trends in mind, uh, the AGHI Biotics Working Group has proposed four basic values that should be held throughout the research project. These are transparency, honesty, and respect, confidentiality, and fairness. We didn't come up these four at the beginning, but we gradually came to form uh, these four core values as we went through lots of discussions. We will come back to these four ba basics later. Uh, let's focus on uh, more specific ethical issues at each step of this sort of large-scale genomic genetic studies. Oh. So what are possible ethical issues? I will briefly overview the ethical issues of research aspect and clinical aspect of the AGHI. In the research aspect of this sort of research, we will encounter <coughs> issues of broad, broad consent and protection of patient privacy 
and how to return results to research participants. In the clinical aspect, we encountered the ethical issue of avoiding therapeutic misconception in patient participants and of how to respect potential participants. Little. First, AGAGI has had to tackle with some bioethical research ethics issues at each of three steps. Data or sample collection, storage, and data mining. <laughs> Let's look at ethical issues about sample collection. Informed consent process starts with recruiting. In the Tuskegee syphilis study, participants were recruited by being told that all black men had bad blood, which was inaccurate, deceptive, and unethical. So we wanted to do the right thing from the very beginning till the end of this community community engaging project. So we needed to carefully define who should be recruited, whether we want to include minors, incompetent patients, and other vulnerable people for whom we need to devise extra precaution and protection. And we needed to carefully define what to explain to such potential participants when recruiting them. And we thought we must disclose conflict of interest while carefully explaining how important this project is for current and future patients and for the general health of people in Alabama. And after recruiting potential participants, we officially obtain informed consent. One ethical issue at this step is whether it is okay to obtain what is called broad consent to our project. Specific consent means uh, research participants give consent to a particular research project that has a specific aim, specific duration and endpoint, like a typical clinical trial to test a certain experimental drug. As regards to the large scale population genetic studies, such as the AGHI, however, we want to utilize a database in Biobank It is in Biobank um, uh, for unspecified broad research purposes for unspecified period of time. So we needed to obtain from participants the consent for such broad uses of their samples and their health data. So we had to discuss whether and how we can ethically justify the use of broad consent. We also discussed what, what to inform potential participants and ways to inform them. Ethics of broader consent and consent for minors, substitute consent, and what to inform potential participants and ways to inform were the main concerns at this point of informed consent. And after samples or data are collected, they are stored in a database or a biobank which comes with the ethical issue of security and privacy. So we, need to, so we need to get prepared for possible data hacking or inadvertent data leakage. We also have to clearly define who should access to the database and who should manage the identification key that links identifiable personal information and de-identified data. We also needed to de delineate contract-based obligations of data managers or honest brokers as regards to confidentiality, safety, and the veracity of data. When the data manager leaves the job, we make sure that he or she continues to keep essential information confidential. And there are also problems that could occur from sharing data statewide or nationwide. The biggest issue is possible re-identification of sample donors. I will explain this a bit more in the next slide. And there's also the question of what to do with novel clinical findings or secondary findings we obtain through research and whether and how we should give any feedback to <coughs> participants or biospecimen donors. Let me explain the issue of re-identification. Even though the database and biobank are supposed to be carefully de-identified, whose uh, whole genome sequence data are unique to only one person, making them vulnerable to re-identification. For example, in 2013 science, pa science paper, Melissa Jimrek and her colleagues at the Whitehead Institute at MIT reported that they could 
successfully profiled the full identities of 50 individuals who participated in public sequencing projects. What they did was this. The researchers uh, first obtained the de-identified sequencing data, de-identified sequencing data sets from public sequencing projects, which are just like ours, the AJJ, and they, they profiled short tandem repeats on the Y chromosome. YSDRs of those anonymized participants. They use the data on Y chromosome because it's unique to each biological family inherited from father to son. Then they cross references such YSGR data, the information on the Y chromosome, uh, with recreational genetic genealogy databases such as Ancestry.com or Family Finder. Then they could infer they could infer surnames of not all but many of those de-identified genetic data. Then the researchers searched those surnames together with other metadata, such as age and state using people finders or white pages, which are also free and publicly accessible online databases. As a result, researchers could figure out the full identity, including full name, address, and phone number of multiple targets. So we need to be ready to handle such re-identification of sample donors. So we can remove the part of genomic data such as YSDRs uh, that might be used to identify an individual. However, whether such strictly de-identified data will still remain sufficient research value after removal of all identifiers is an open question. <coughs> Then there are ethical issues with data mining uh, through whole genome sequencing uh, or targeted resequencing. The biggest issue, as, as you suggested, is what to do with incidental or secondary findings. Researchers may find a person's genetic predisposition to a disease uh, treatable with early intervention, such as familial adenomatous prognosis, or they may also find a mutation leading to a currently, un currently uncurable disease, such as Huntington's. Or the sequencing may incidentally reveal the fact that a sample donor is not a biological child of his or her parent. So we have faced the questions of whether to inform sample donors of such findings and whether we should include a, a pre-arrangement clause and the informed consent document to let participants know how we handle such incidental or secondary findings. And uh, this slide shows the AGAGI, our attempt to handle all, handle all those ethical issues. We decided to obtain broad consent from potential participants, but we tried to convey everything we know about, everything we know and everything we don't know about future users of participant data and biospecimens as honestly as possible. In the informed consent document, we clearly stated that we will use participant sample and data for unspecified future research. But at the same time, we promise that these will, all, these will be all medical research, including non, excluding non-medical research, Medic, all medical research individually approved by the IRB. And to better protect participant confidentiality, we also obtained the certificate of confidentiality from the NIH. We are not funded by the NIH, but we can still uh, uh, obtain certificate of uh, confidentiality through the NIH. Certificates of confidentiality are the formal certificates which all allow the researcher to re refuse to disclose identifying information on research participants in any civil criminal, administrative, legislative, or other proceeding, whether at the federal, state, or local level, unless the participant, unless the participant consent. And as for returning results, we included in our informed consent document a clear statement to return that we will return medically actionable results only, which means results about ACMG 59 at present. Uh, though we, we also stated that this list may be expanded in the future. Meanwhile, we also mentioned that we may possibly recontact former participants regarding new findings. And to be honest, uh, we, cannot guarantee, we cannot guarantee that we will be able to return all new findings to all 10, more than 10,000 plus participants in the future, which will depend on our technology and budget available to us years later. 
and we think we should not make false promise. So we stated that we will surely return medically actionable results, but retain, refrain from stating we will definitely return all results that will become available in the future. But we will at least do our best to disseminate novel findings through our websites of public relations, etc. And we may possibly try to reconduct to convey new medically significant findings as long as our budget allows. Any questions up to this point? Maybe you're going to discuss this later, but it seems like one of the non-medically actionable kinds of data that people would might want to know is if there's data that might infect their reproductive choices down the road, mm -hmm. whether um, yeah, for diseases that... Yeah, we will not disclose that, the carrier status either. So yeah, the, okay. that's a, that, there's a still remaining question about oh, whether we how we can best meet the participants' expectations to this. You know, many people are, will participate in this project because they have some sort of concerns about their health problems, depending on their family histories. But we decided not to. Yes. So if in the future uh, they develop a new treatment for currently untreatable genetic conditions, such as ALS, mm -hmm. uh, and if the healthy volunteer wants to know mm -hmm if that their genome sequencing had those mm -hmm. mutations or not, mm -hmm. then will it be possible for mm -hmm. you to do so that analysis if, again? Uh, <laughs> if the SEMG expand the list of all of the recommended, recommended uh, action, medical action of genes, we will expand the list, that list of, to be returned. And also uh, we have the variant review committee in which we discuss whether we should return the result of, about the significant uh, uh, findings. So whenever the list gets expanded, mm -hmm. then the healthy volunteers will gonna get uh, expanded information. Yes. Okay. Although I'm, I'm sure there could be problems that you may not be able to find the healthy volunteers later. Mm -hmm. um, they don't, yes. they don't contract with you necessarily right. to stay in touch mm -hmm. with their contact information. Mm -hmm. So at that level, you can't be expected yeah. to or we can Fine, we can uh, track down the you know former participants uh, within the limited <coughs> budget. Uh, that, that 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 that's also another. But my understanding is that there is an expectation that if somebody asked you to reanalyze their data mm -hmm. in terms of the new current medically actionable mm -hmm. information, you would be obligated to mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. Yes. They, they they have the they have the option to reconduct us and see. Question. So for these uh, genetic tests, is it uh, kind of like the standard to only report the medically actionable uh, results? What if someone wants to know, I mean, even if there's no cure for it, could it be like optional? Um, so the person would be making their own decision? Uh, currently, we do not do that. Yeah. Are there any instances when this is... Uh, then for maybe other studies. Um, yeah, in, in other studies, they 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 also use that. that some some other studies, uh, they use different list of uh, what they regard as medically actionable genes list. And some other so Gell syndrome studies, uh, foundation studies use a more expanded uh, list of medically actionable genes. And we should be clear about uh, our our policy, but we don't need reports. This is fascinating. Uh, my mind is just. Turning. I wanted to know, um, this seems very technical. We're in Alabama with a low health literacy. Mm -hmm. um, how easy are y'all making the informed consent? Or what right. readability uh, level is the informed consent? Because yeah. just hearing medically actionable results, I know what it means. Mm -hmm. But someone, an uh, older adult uh, with a sixth grade education, mm -hmm. Um, that was found in the uh, study of aging that mm -hmm. I think it was sixth grade mm -hmm. education. How would they be able to understand the informed yes, consent? We, we just don't give that, give them the informed consent document and ask them to read them on their own. We, we, uh, so we, we, we are training uh, the patient navigator uh, who, who, who is not a scientist, but who can explain uh, what's written on the informed consent document and the point of some of the parts of the informed consent document about the meaning of the gene and genomes and the variant or genetic changes, 
for what it means, uh, what medically actionable gene uh, means uh, in a lay personal language to the participants. Uh, and, and I personally give the, uh, I give, no, I officially give the uh, biotech training of how to uh, explain some of the points, important points on the informed consent document with the patient navigators. And that's, that's the, Best thing. Uh, that, that's the thing. That's the thing we, we, we thought what we should do. But there may be other ways to uh, better handle this. Uh, it's a great process. story. Mm -hmm. But we try, we try to do our best. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so let's turn to the clinical aspect of GHI real quick. Uh, some sample donors are healthy at the time of sample donation and others are patients with cancer or other devastating disease, and still others are people with the family history of such diseases. So we need to consider how to inform, uh, how to inform, uh, uh, counsel, and heal such patients. So informing, uh, when we explain our project to desperate patients, uh, we need to avoid therapeutic misconception. Patients may regard the blood draw as part of treatment, and they may believe they are receiving some kind of medical care by provide, providing blood to AGHI. We should avoid such misunderstanding. And counseling. When we counsel patients for the presence of certain medically actionable variants, we need to consider how to explain such findings to patients. Also, when we find nothing, that are on the ACMG list of disease-related genes. We may tell patients that we have found nothing, but then the participants may mistakenly believe that they are perfectly healthy now and won't have any disease in the future. So we need to educate people that genotyping or sequencing may not be a perfect pre predictive tool for healthy individuals. And finally, providing personalized care. When we provide personalized care for patients, we need to determine what health condition to treat, to what extent. For example, do we endorse preventive, preventive organ removal for people with BRCA1 or 2, two mutations like Angelina Jolie did? So these are the kinds of ethical issues that pertain to the population-based genomic slash genetic studies that have certain clinical components like the AGHR. And this is a policy we developed to promote ethical interactions with patient participants. In addition to developing informed consent forms, we had training sessions uh, with patient navigators and instructed them to emphasize the following. Number one, uh, we try our best to clearly explain the research nature, research nature of this initiative. While we strive to offer medical benefits to each participant as much as we can at this point, the ultimate goal of the AGHIs is to promote our knowledge about genomic uh, medicine through biobank and database research and to benefit patients in the future. And we also try to honestly explain that the direct benefits to our participants may be limited. And we also say that those who will receive positive genotyping results will be only one to three percent. And we also disclose research risks such as physical risks, privacy risks and group risks. And then we cautiously explain the meaning of results to avoid misunderstanding. For example, both patient navigators and recruiters or genetic counselors are instructed to emphasize the following things. Patients shouldn't be too relieved upon receiving negative results, which 90 per, about 98% of uh, the uh, healthy individuals will, will receive uh, or expected to receive. Uh, some people develop breast cancer, for example, without having brought down one or two mutations. And participants should continue following medical advice and routine uh, disease screening, such as mammogram or blood pressure check or other things. So it's, it, all of them are clearly stated on the informed consent document, and uh, patient navigators are instructed to emphasize and point to this point. And please remember, please continue uh, the routine screening uh, because it does not negative results will not show that uh, you will not acquire any gen genetic related disease or what is whatsoever. And 
as part of our policy on ethical interaction with participants, we also emphasize respecting the will of potential participants. So if a person expresses concerns and refuses to participate in the AGHI, uh, we, we make sure that we don't coerce and we don't persuade him or her by misleading explanation or making false promise. And we will ask him or her instead to fill out the non-participation survey if possible. Uh, because that may uh, that may reveal some ethical ethics related concerns that the participants may have. And furthermore, if a patient a participant is upset or expresses concern about the involvement in the AGHI uh, during the uh, process, we ask patient navigators, study coordinators, genetic counselors, and anyone who notices it to immediately notify the bioethics working group so that we can discuss those ethical concerns with the entire research team. So we think we are doing our best, but our limited perspective may not capture all ethical issues that may arise in the future. And so in, interdisciplinary teamwork will be a key to solving such un, 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 unanticipated problems. So getting back to our four core values, we believe that this will be a helpful basis of ethical operationalizing of population-based genomic genetic studies. Transparency and honesty, meaning we should be honest about research benefits and risks, and we shouldn't deceive or mislead the potential participants. And respect, meaning we should honor a patient's choice to participate or not to participate and we should avoid exploitation or stigmatization, and we should do our best to respect patient privacy. And confidentiality, meaning we should keep sensitive personal information as confidential as possible. Even though it may not be perfect, we will do our best. And fairness, uh, we should reach out to diverse population, and we do not exclude or exploit any specific group of people. And to be honest, our ethics is work in progress, and there may be better ways to resolve those ethical concerns, and we may be mistaken in not addressing certain important ethical issues. So we try to be open to any questions, potential concerns, and criticisms, and simply try to do our best in behaving the most ethical way we can possibly conceive of. Anyway, what I shared with you today was a brief summary of the ethical issues we have encountered so far and how we are trying to handle those ethical issues. Uh, so you mentioned before, I kind of missed it, but you said uh, with uh, patients who's having symptoms, they would receive whole genome sequencing and the results of it. Uh, those with the healthy volunteers, they would receive 59 actionable uh, gene mutations that's currently defined. Are they also getting the whole genome sequencing and just receiving those 59 results, or are they just getting screening of those 459? The healthy, uh, healthy, healthy volunteers will, will receive the, only the genome testing results. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, they will not receive whole genome sequencing. But, but they're tested for their whole genome. No. no? no. Okay. So no. that's uh, my question. So is that fair? I mean, he, the fairness is one of the core, core value. Right. Um, those healthy volunteers may be in the same uh, state five years or ten years later with those who's currently having symptoms. You don't know. And maybe in ten years they may not have a chance like this to get their genome tested without cost. And would, do you think it would be more fair if they get a chance to sell it between a screening versus whole genome sequencing? Yeah, in an ideal world, it would be fair to let them undergo whole genome sequencing, but there's a budget limit. <laughs> but we want to, and, and we want to, you know, uh, reach out to as many people as individuals possible, and we hope to uh, reach out to people at least one in each country, counting in Alabama. Great, thank you. I have a question in terms of um, where this all fits. For example, are you working, you mentioned Tuskegee, are you working with Dr. Shodake? Okay, and then here, are you working with Sarah Knight, mm -hmm. Dr. Knight? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's that project, mm -hmm. right? Okay, do y'all have any lay members, lay uh, community members on the board? On the board, on the board. Uh, in a working group, 
In the working group. In yes. the working group, no. No. But we, we uh, the Dr. Sarah Knight will uh, try to have a key informant <coughs> interview. Key informant interview uh, okay. to, uh, to, to, to do, uh, to listen to the voices and ethical concerns that might be raised from the uh, community leaders. <laughs> it seems like this is a tremendous opportunity just to learn what the concerns of the community are. Is your study, um, does it include an investigation of the nature of the community's um, fears and expectations of genomic research? We, we're and, trying to collaborate with Dr. Sarah Knight and uh, we try to uh, Figure out. This is a tremendous opportunity to uh, clarify the ethical, possible ethical concerns that people in Alabama may have about the research. So we want to we want to look into that. That's part of our project. This is great. I, I, I did read the consent. I did. The, I read the consent because I was interested in participating. I had and I had some concerns mm -hmm. um, because it does say that on the long term, you know, they will store your DNA sample, which is whatever, fine. But it didn't specify for this is linked to the medical information. So it didn't specify if you're gonna have access to my medical information forever, and if you are gonna have access to my medical information just from like UAB since it was I was signing here, or to any of my potential future providers. Well, medical information. Comes... And again, I'm just concerned because the consent didn't really give any details regarding that. Mm -hmm. Part. Mm -hmm. I look into that. But uh, medical, uh, the, those information will come from the medical questionnaire that uh, participants will answer, and also come from the if they are UAB patients, their their information is already stored in the medical uh, ERN, and then it will be uh, extracted to I I two B two. Uh, which patients should have consented when they when they signed up, signed up as a patient, and we will use those de-identifying uh, data, uh, which will be connected to uh, the biobank. So this is a sort of limited concern at the moment because not very many of our medical databases talk to each other effectively now. But one of the reasons that I2B2, which I don't think we've talked about very explicitly yet, but we'll hear about in the informatics talk that is coming soon, is a tool to really extract data from um, clinical databases in a sort of standardized format that should facilitate um, integrating of data across broad national uh, sources, and that will become a bigger issue as we go forward mm -hmm. on how to how to know what the limits are. And well, the data. Mm -hmm. upon, uh, I, I think I wonder which, uh, what version of informed consent form you 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 saw, but uh, in the latest version, we uh, we made it clear that the patient may re participants may can request to uh, remove. The data from the, the, the not only the sample but also the uh, specimen related data from the database. You know, but my concern is regarding for how long um, am I giving you access to my future years of private medical information? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Because yeah. I mean, like right now, if you use the R32 or whatever the mm -hmm. name is of this mm -hmm. resource. Um, to we find my medical to, yeah. information and I don't have anything, but some of the variants that you're looking for now like, are of uncertain significance. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's some interest to identify those are clinically significant yeah. or not in the future. So you might be able to go back to my medical chart because I signed a consent 20 years ago mm -hmm. um, and see if I actually developed any medical right, condition right, too. Right. So that is really not clear mm -hmm. on the consent. Yeah, I mean that we didn't specifically clarify that point because we cannot clarify that to, to what extent, how long this project will continue. Uh, if this initiative will continue after five years is a, is, a, is a big question for us. So there's a limitation, there's an uncertainty about the direction of this study. Yeah, I'm, again, I'm just concerned because legally it's kind of open-ended, so theoretically you could have then, I have been consenting you to look my medical record forever. Mm -hmm. The way it's written, I, 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 that's my until, interpretation. Until the project will end. 
until the project will end. But the project at the moment is funded for five years, we hope, but could go on longer than that if mm -hmm. somebody decides it has value. So there's uncertainty about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we cannot can make a false promise that this will, this will end in five years or this will continue forever. So we, we have to make it open. So that's why. So, but, but thanks for pointing that out. And in regards to her question, we had a presentation last week about the bio uh, repository. And um, isn't there uh, a time frame in terms of what I think the, the scientists said, D get, D, can't say the word, doesn't DNA to break down after a certain oh, amount of time I'm, anyway? I'm, I'm not an expert in that. In, in that, that you know, I think of the biological materials that exist, DNA is one of the most durable. So, okay, you know, so people are people are still getting information from um, things gotten out of the uh, pyramids in Egypt. So, um, you, you, uh, I don't think we know how sensitive those tools are likely to be in the future either. So. Um, oh, this, I, I want to add one more point, uh, but at least they're all participants. If they feel comfortable at any moment, they can they can request to remove their specimens right. and destroy the specimens and their uh, specimen related data from the data. Withdraw the, those data from the biobank. What's the current status of enrollment? Uh, currently, uh, as I uh, as of the end of um, January, uh, there are over 1,400 participants. Wow. Do you exclude anyone, or do you take all comers at this point? I am not entirely sure. Really, uh, I think at this point, we, we, we welcome, but we, we, we monitor the diversity of the participants. Have you learned anything about people who refuse to participate, what the uh, not, issues are? Not at this point. Uh, we we have uh, under enrollment and uh, male uh, as opposed to the female and also uh, in African American population. But then the, the reason for that maybe we we are not doing our best effort to reach out to those populations. But we don't know. All right, my last question, I promise. Um, I attended <laughs> Dr. Knight's presentation, and the one thing that I mentioned in terms of, in terms of recruiting from communities of color, African Americans in Alabama, when you look at the scientists on the project, there's no one that looks like me. Right. You can look in this room, and I'm the only one. Yeah, that's so until <laughs> y'all change that, until you have somebody, a layperson from the community, I recommended that before, and a scientist, that will give, it will give the appearance, even if it's not true, I hate to right, say right. that, to the African American right. community, right. that there are people on the board who's going to hold those who are not from the community accountable. Right. And until they see representation, yeah. They're not going to sign up. That's the reason, part of the reason why I invited Dr. Shodaki from Tuskegee. But to, Dr. Shodaki is African. He's not African American. Right. So he gets a free pass. Yes. He's in the United States. Right. States is different. Yes. Right. The mind. If you could recommend me the, the best person in, in the African American community who, who can serve. Him. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the reason. So there let are. Me know your, let me know your contact information. <laughs> great, great. Yeah, so there are so many reasons to improve the diversity of our communities. And I, mean, I can tell you, so there was a phase, so I was a department chair for a while, and just to give you a sense of the impact of your, an individual's background, there was a period where every recruitment for new faculty above the level of assistant professor was required to have an African-American member on the search committee. That meant that the African American faculty at UAB basically spent half of their life on search committees because there were so few, there were so many searches going on, it was devastating to their career. So anyway, there are all kinds of issues that come up from having a not very heterogeneous community that we work in. And UAB, frankly, is good in terms of many institutions for our level of diversity, um, but there's a long way to go. There's a huge long way to go. Great.
Okay, um, any other questions? So I, I hope this has been stimulating to think about the kind of issues that come up. There's going to be a lot to learn from how this study unfolds. There will be settings in which the good intentions don't match up with the outcome for some individual, and it's going to be complicated for how to deal with that. But um, I, I hope you've gotten the sense that the, the team is trying to think ahead, um, and uh, this is a challenging area. So. Um, Anyway, thanks very much. We'll take a, a five minute break and then we'll have our second panel. Thank you. Thank you. He's such a peaceful spirit. He's so intelligent. Just a really nice man. Yeah, he's just, he's just, he's just Yes, exactly. Gina McCaskill, mm -hmm. by the way. I'm a Wigmore scholar, so that's all I know about the short yeah, I won't come up because I have to use this computer to make fun. I don't have to do that. But I really need to do that. But if I make this, I'm not going to do that. 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 I'm not going to do that.
other situations where uh, the researchers did not have that support. That's a very significant challenge. So it's finding something that can do the research but still have support in the process. But yeah, it comes down to it. The research is trying to find the information that no one knows yet. <laughs> We'll go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, the speaker for our second half of the morning is Dr. Monica Baskin, who's Associate Professor in the Department of Medicine, Division of Preventive Medicine. Uh, Dr. Baskin is going to talk about translational research in diverse populations. Um, she's been very interested in how to include diverse populations in research for her whole career. Um, I believe she got her degree at Georgia State University in psychology. Um, it's been at UAB for a lifetime, 14 years. Um, she's the vice chair in the Department of Medicine for Culture and Diversity. Um, she participates in, as far as I can tell, at least half of the research centers at UAB <laughs> as a consulting scientist um, and has tr tremendous uh, background in um, approaches to uh, integrating diverse communities into research in a positive and equitable way. So, really glad to have you here. And go ahead. Um, so, it's definitely a pleasure to come and talk about, um, you know, as I mentioned, something that I've been focused on for a large part of my career. So, trained as a psychologist, um, I made a transition to really focus on population health and um, preventive medicine, if you will, um, several years ago and have been quite um, enthused about where things have progressed over time. So my attempt today is to, or this morning, is to kind of go through a few things um, 
And I'm going to try to do so without the anxiety of the last discussion at the end when I walked in. <laughs> and um, but hopefully we will similarly have some kind of dialogue when, when I finish. But I want to talk about some things that you probably are already aware of to start off with, some of the disparities that exist in, uh, geographically, particularly in our region in the Deep South. Um, then briefly talk about determinants of health and then give you a little bit more of a deeper dive in terms of the regional and local context for um, what may be going on in these communities that you may want to work in, in in terms of um, um, these diverse backgrounds. And then lastly, leave you with a couple of tools that I have used over the past um, 15 years or more in this space in terms of engaging and working closely with uh, more diverse populations. So first and foremost, um, I'll present to you a couple of things that you probably already know. So this first slide is looking at ge uh, geographic disparities related to obesity, which is one of my primary areas of research. And what do you see uh, on this map? Alabama's in the worst. <laughs> yeah, so, so we, we're kind of typically in that number one, number two, number three spot um, in terms of having the highest rates of obesity in the country. So those darker colored um, um, shaded states there have obesity that, adult obesity that's greater than or equal to 35% of the entire population. <laughs> so this is another one looking at diabetes. Um, so here, what do you see? The diabetes belt. Yeah, the diabetes <laughs> belt. Yeah, so the Deep South again is very well represented um, in terms of individuals, adults who have been diagnosed with diabetes. So. Um, oftentimes it is referred to as a diabetes belt. And then another area that I, um, a, a lot of my NIH funded research is in cancer disparity. So um, the same here is true in terms of looking at um, age adjusted death rates in terms of cancer. And this Mid South and Deep South region is one that is overly represented in terms of um, cancer mortality. But then there are also health behaviors that are relevant. So thinking about cancer, um, diabetes, and obesity, um, diet is one of those behavioral risk factors that plays a role in each of those conditions. And, and again, as you look at, this is data looking at the percentage of adults who report consuming fruit less than once a day. Um, all of those in the darker blue color, that's about anywhere from 44% to 56% uh, of the adult population saying they eat one or fewer fruits um, a day. <coughs> and the same can be said for consuming one or uh, fewer vegetables per day. So again, um, the Deep South region, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, are very much um, represented as some of the states that have the highest rate of um, what you would consider to be um, poor diet. And then there's physical activity. So this is a study that looked at um, not only the region of the country, but looked further into disparities that may exist between urban and rural communities. And a lot of my research has been in rural Alabama and Mississippi. And what you can see here in terms of physical inactivity, um, the highest rates of inactive adults happen to be in those areas that are in the South and in rural communities. So um, that's a little bit, um, probably a snippet, and probably a lot of things that you know already, that we have geographic disparities, that the Deep South region is one of the areas that has the highest rates of disease, mortality, and morbidity, and some of the leading causes of death, and then also does quite poorly in terms of those lifestyle factors that could minimize risk. But I wanted to turn attention to looking at those things that might in fact, influence health. So this is a framework um, by Paula Graveman and colleagues that really wants to put in perspective, um, you know, what things really go into the health that we see in our in our population. And so this particular graphic looks at uh, or proposes that medical care plays a role, personal behavior, um, but also the living and working conditions that um, people are in. Um, their homes and their communities, and then the larger political and economic structure also plays a role. But anyone want to take a guess as to um, a percentage wise how much medical care really plays into this um, equation? Anyway, just yell it out. How many? 10%. 10%? 
you cheated. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so despite the fact that um, I am in, a, in the School of Medicine and the Department of Medicine, and that our nation has been focused a lot on health and healthcare reform, um, based on a lot of um, data from health economists and people who are much smarter than me, um, what they find is on average, um, what really um, influences your health um, has a, only a little, medical care, care only has a little bit to do with all of that. It's all of those other things that really play a role in terms of who is sick and who is well, um, who's going to live longer and who um, may die might, may die sooner. So we call those things sort of the social determinants of health. And so in healthypeople.gov, um, part of the you know the Healthy People 2020 now, I guess is what we're on. Um, they talk about the conditions in which people are born, live, and age really affect their health. Um, and so it's that component that I hope to share a little bit more with you today to hopefully get you to understand the context in which um, communities, people in these communities that you might work in um, live and how that may influence the health as well. Can I interrupt just yes. so, you know, we hear an awful lot about how the United States scores relatively poorly internationally in terms of health outcomes. Yes. And so that must be linked up a lot with this difference between the impact of the different domains on health in the end. Is there a sense whether it's spread over, that kind of difference is spread over every domain of the graphic you showed, or are there particular areas where there's greater actionability for improving the public so health outcomes? Theoretically, there are um, parts of that that are more actionable than not. And it's a nice segue to um, this next slide, which really the World Health Organization Commission on the Social Determinants of Health in 2008 really put out and laid out in several hundred pages about how we close the gap in a generation in terms of this disparities. And so absolutely the data shows that the United States health outcomes, so the the primary health outcomes of a nation are really look, you look, really look at infant mortality, life expectancy. Um, those really tell you a good picture of the health of that nation. And the US, particularly relative to other wealthier countries, um, we score very much at the bottom. And a lot of that has been, um, a lot of people sort of uh, account that to the disparities that exist in our social circumstances. So income, for example, and education, and sort of that balance between the haves and the have nots, nots is that gap in there that is actually perpetuating some of the disparities. So I think the answer in terms of the actionable strategies that the World Health Organization talks about is an urgent need to actually address the social conditions in which people live, and therefore you will lead to improving their health overall. And, and so they just define so, um, health disparities as a toxic combination of poor social policies and programs, unfair economic arrangements, and bad politics. So from the World Health Organization standpoint, this is where your actions would go. So what are those social policies and programs that would improve the conditions in which people live? Um, how can you balance out your economic arrangements and get rid of bad politics? And if you're able to do all of those things, then we wouldn't see the disparities that exist. So in essence, I think there, um, this is kind of the way we've approached um, in the US in particular, we've approached population health um, by simply just moving ahead and totally ignoring this big um, you know, iceberg in the middle of, of the ocean um, that is that social determinants of health. And even though we've hit it and we've got a huge hole in our ship, um, we just keep, you know, just throwing out the water. Um, but there's a need to have a change in our paradigm. We've got to stop thinking only about what happens when the patient comes to the hospital, um, because there's so many things that actually influence um, why they came to the hospital or if they came at all. And they're definitely going to influence whether or not they are adherent to whatever that prescription is that they get once they come here. So, so the most of what the rest of my um, conversation with you today is getting you to think about what are those other factors outside of medicine, outside of medical care that we all need to keep in mind. So um, I'll start with a couple of sets of data, sort of beginning um, generally just talking about the Deep South or the South region. So this is data from the Kaiser Family Foundation. 
Um, and one of the first things I think we have to have an appreciation for is that the, the racial ethnic makeup of the South is different from the rest of the U.S. Um, in particular, the percentage of African American um, African Americans in this region is um, significantly larger than any other part of the country. And um, given that a lot of the disparities that we see are along racial ethnic lines, that plays a role in terms of um, you know who shows up for healthcare and who do we need to focus on for prevention. Um, another thing to keep into perspective is this idea around income and, and the World Health Organization talked about economic policies. Um, but again, looking at, um, by, looking at the United States by region, the South has a higher proportion of individuals that live below the poverty level. And that also influences health. And then there are things like education. So this is data actually looking just at the state of Alabama that was published recently um, that looked at failing uh, or grading the school districts. So this um, came out, I think, earlier this month. And one of the things that um, is depicted on this map is that the school districts that received A, so there were a total of 12 of those school districts throughout the state, um, less than 50% of those students who attend those school districts live in poverty. And all but two of them had poverty levels for their students at less than 40%. And juxtapose that to the 19 school districts that received a D, all of those school districts um, had high poverty and 15 out of 19 had 100% of their students in the school district living in poverty. And then that may also translate into the other educational outcomes that we look at in terms of who's graduating. So this is looking at data across Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida, and fewer than 80% of students um, in, on average um, in 2013 were graduating. Um, but more importantly, I think on this map is looking at the diversity there. So within states, there are certain um, communities where they have graduation rates that are far above 95%, and then there are those that are well below 75%. And um, so I think that's also important as a context to look at in terms of how we interpret it, how we interpret those geographic disparities that we talked about at the beginning. What are the yellow counties? Like the lighter colors? Are they just not? No, no data. Okay. No data. Yeah. Yes. What the best county is? This is that Troy and Dothan or what? Um, okay, so you all are gonna have to help me with my geography of Alabama. I think I was left at Dothan. Yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely not Dothan. Um, anyone else? Is that Madison County? No, that's Madison. No. It's up by Huntsville. Huntsville is up north. Oh, anyway. Okay. We're near Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but again, there's some variability in there to look at. Um, and then I think this one, sort of thinking about the ge geographic or the demographics, um, this is looking at health. So again, in the South, um, as we saw from the issues around diabetes and obesity and cancer, um, the Southern region has um, the highest number of adults who are reporting poor, fair or poor health status um, in terms of this particular study. And this one I mentioned before that one of the, um, the global measures of the health of a nation has to do with infant mortality. And so um, the infant mortality rate per thousand live births in the South is higher um, than among any of the other regions. And I'm gonna have you to kind of hold on and think about that 6.7% in just a few minutes. So, Montgomery yes, County. Montgomery, great, okay. Our capital, of course. Thank you. Um, so, so that's the region um, and a little bit about the state. I wanna spend a little bit more time going in depth about Jefferson County. So one of the titles that I hold is the leader of the Jefferson County Collaborative for Health Equity. And um, about five years ago, we published a report um, that was titled Place Matters for Our Health in Jefferson County looking at the status of health equity on the 50th anniversary of the civil rights movement in Birmingham, Alabama. And the goal here in this group, which is made up of individuals who 
you know, our public health researchers, um, public health practitioners. We had representatives from local government, um, from nonprofit agencies. We came together um, as a part of a national organization that was um, the National Place Matters uh, Group. And we wanted to look at the intersection between race, place, and health and trying to look retrospectively from 2013 back to 1963 in those 50 years of, um, of, of hopefully change. And so there are <coughs> lots of components of that report, um, but I'll just, I just picked out a couple of things to share with you today. So first of all, we looked at sort of the racial ethnic makeup of the county. And so in general, Jefferson County here in, in um, the Birmingham area is primarily black and white. Um, so 42% of individuals on the, um, the most recent census at that time um, identified as being black or African-American, 52% um, identified as white, uh, with a 4% Hispanic population, 1% Asian, and then um, another 1% um, identifying as quote unquote other. Um, the other piece to kind of look at with that, so, so we know the demographics, but racial segregation is something that was really important and has been shown to have um, a correlation with a number of outcomes, including health. So we wanted to look and see what was the racial segregation um, in Jefferson County. And so we use a dissimilarity index, and basically that just means the percentage of people who would have to move from where they currently live to someplace else for there to be a fully integrated um, community. And that dissimilarity index was about 76% in 1980. It had been reduced to about 65% or so in um, 2010. So definitely an improvement, but still more than half of the people would have to pick up and move um, in Jefferson County in order to have a more integrated community. And so part of what we wanted to do in this report was not only speak to academics, but also um, put a, a picture of sorts out there to people who could have influence over those social policies and programs um, and economic environments and so forth. So really approach that social determinants of health. And so what we ended up doing was mapping um, this information. So this is a map of Jefferson County. Um, the different segments there are the various census tracts across the county. And um, the blue dots are representing individuals who identified as being black. Red dots are individuals who identified as white. Um, green is Hispanic and yellow is Asian. So giving you a minute just to orient yourself to the map, um, anyone want to just shout out what you, if anything, um, what strikes you about this particular map? I mean, I think it's pretty obvious. We've got the red, whites on one side, and then the blue, blacks on the other. Okay, so, so some obvious things in terms of the, the color patterns here. You've got blue on sort of one side, red on the other side. So, so definitely thinking about those demographics that I mentioned, about 65% about of people had to move, it's pretty clear here where people are living. I think geographically that blue area with the blacks is related to how close they are to the interstate because um, they got to be able to get to work if they don't have a car or transportation system. And those areas may have more um, places of employment where they're likely to work, okay. like McDonald's or Burger King, TJ Maxx up and down that 59, 2059 corridor. So, so one theory is that um, we might see a higher um, population among blacks living near the highways at, um, as a function of trying to have appropriate transportation to work. Were you going to add something to that? I was going to say the same thing along the interstate. Yeah, so it looks like there's something about the interstate that seems to make a difference here on this map. So the other thing we looked at was income. So in 2011, about 13% of the households in the Jefferson County area reported to the census that they um, lived at or below the poverty level for a family of four. At that time, was about 22,000. Um, I think um, definitely based on my colleagues in the health department, we think that's probably a gross underrepresentation of the poverty that exists, but probably is probably accurate in terms of um, who was answering the census and how they reported at that time. 
But we did the same thing in terms of mapping um, that we did before in terms of where people live. Um, and this is looking at individuals, a percent of the population in poverty. So the darkest colors there, that darker green, um, are um, census tracts where 37 to 64 and a half percent of that census tract um, has families living um, below the poverty level. So what, if anything, do you see here? It overlaps with the other maps. Yeah, so it looks like there might be some overlap between the map that we showed before with terms of ra racial uh, residential um, patterns and this one. And then again, um, because we know that healthy lifestyles can help contribute to health and um, we, we also wanted to look at healthy food access. So this is data from the USDA where they found that about 41 out of the total 147 census tracts in Jefferson County, so about 160,000 individuals, um, lived in areas that were considered to be a food desert. And based on the USDA um, definition, this is a place where at least 500 people and or at least 33% of the population lives more uh, a mile or more away from a supermarket or a large grocery store. And why might the supermarket and large grocery store be the, um, the, the factor here? Why would they consider that? Any thoughts? Buying produce or healthy food. So tell me a little bit. So buying produce and healthy foods, what does that mean? I mean, if you're more than a mile and you don't have transportation, you're not gonna be able to buy things to cook and eat healthier and you're gonna be more likely to go to a fast food restaurant. Okay, so part of it is um, larger grocery stores, supermarkets are more inclined to have fresher produce and um, and so that may be one issue. The other issue is the mile is used because that's generally considered that most folks can kind of without having motorized transportation get to a place. What else might be specific about grocery stores and supermarkets? Uh, the cost of the bodegas or grocery stores within a community, say like Southside, it tends to be higher than, uh, say, the Walmart or yeah. other large. Yeah, so stores. smaller mom pop um, stores, convenience stores, things of that nature, tend to um, have um, a, a greater you know, uh, flexibility in terms of their pricing structure, and they oftentimes can be more expensive just because you're paying for the convenience. When you have the larger stores, the, the cost of those are usually determined by someone in the region or nationally, so you don't have as much of a variation. If you go to you know, one Publix versus the other Publix, there's usually not a whole lot of diversity there. So that's part of why they um, use uh, the one mile in the supermarket as part of the definition. I think the other thing is supermarkets are for business, so they will build their uh, business in the more like richer community rather than in the poor community. Yeah. Okay. And so, I mean, and, and so I've had this conversation with lots of people. So again, I work a lot in obesity and nutrition and, and so forth. And so there's always this conversation of, um, you know, which comes first, you know, in terms of do you bring the social, the, the supermarket into the community and then they will buy more or do you build up the demand and then bring the supermarket in? So, you know, there have been many studies to look at why and how um, grocery stores um, make decisions about where they place. And generally it is about cost, it's about financially, um, they're in the business to make money. And so um, it's a part of a market analysis to see is that demand there in order to get the profit margin that they need. And, and we'll see in just a minute about, um, you know, how this may play out and how it has played out in Jefferson County. So, um, so again, we took that first map in terms of racial ethnic distribution and we overlaid in yellow the, um, the census tracts that the USDA identified as a food desert. So all those places in yellow are, um, at least at the time that we did this study, um, were considered to be food deserts. So what, if anything, about this map grabs you? It doesn't overlap many of the white areas. Okay. <laughs> the, red, the red areas. Yeah, it's not a trick question. I mean, it, it really, it really does show you that um, those areas that are less likely to have the grocery store and a supermarket in a one-mile radius and highly um, density, um, highly dense um, census tracts are typically those same communities that have high rates of African Americans. 
So we looked at some behaviors, we looked at the racial distribution. So now I want to come back to um, remember the slide before when I talked about the uh, infant mortality rate being about 6.7% um, in the South. Um, this is data just looking at Jefferson County. And so what we um, found looking at the health department data is that uh, for white mothers, there's the infant mortality rate is about 5.9, so kind of below the state average and the region average. Hispanic mothers were about 6.8, and that was right about the overall um, rate for the region. However, black mothers, uh, infant mortality rate in this county is 17.3%, so clearly a significant difference um, racial and ethnically um, as it related to infant mortality. And again, thinking about um, globally how we think about the health of a community, uh, infant mortality is one of those rates that we see um, and we, we go to all the time. So, so this particular one is one where I often stop and um, you know, sort of talk about this issue of medical care. And I think within our county, we have multiple health systems represented. We have um, tons of great medical care. Uh, but in our county as a whole, we still see these disparities. And so I think it then comes back and hopefully resonates that it's not just about medical care that leads to the disparities. So again, we wanted to map um, infant mortality rate across the county. The darker um, colors here are between 21.8 and 48.2% of that census tract um, where the um, infant mortality, or yeah, the infant mortality rate was between 21.8 and 48.2 in that particular census tract. So, so what do you see here? And it may not be the same as what we've seen before. have a lot higher um, rates in, in the rural areas, which you don't see as much populating on the map in the rural areas on the other. Right. So the previous maps, you know, we really didn't see a lot of um, higher rates um, in the outlying rural um, areas of the county. But this one, it definitely came up. Um, so this then brought in this issue that we had about numbers. Um, so do I have a bunch, any statisticians in the room or people who like to work with um, lots of big data? So, no? Okay. But my epidemiology friends um, also talk about the fact that when you have smaller um, numbers, like in some of the outlying census tracts where the density is not very high, sometimes things get a little squirrely um, in terms of how they get mapped. So we wanted to make sure that what we were seeing and all the other nice color-coded maps really made a difference. And so we applied what's called a hotspot analysis. And this is what you do statistically to see if those differences that we were seeing by census tract made a real difference. So the hotspot analysis, the areas that are shaded in sort of pink and red, are places where um, the rates are um, at least one and a you know one and a half or greater standard deviations above what you would expect if everything was the same. Um, the blue spots are you know um, you know one and a half or lower um, standard deviations from what you would expect if everything is the same. So looking at the hotspot analysis. Um, how confident are you in some of your earlier thoughts in terms of where the differences lie? They disappeared. Okay. So some of the things are disappearing. So the rural things in the infant mortality. Um, but, but what's here based on the statistics? Same thing we've been saying. So some of the earlier things that we saw, some of the differences that we saw at least originally that we're mapping along that 2059 corridor. So, um, so, so for those of you in the room that either uh, are contemplating having babies or you know people who are having babies, um, you certainly would want to be living on um, the right side of that 2059 corridor in terms of looking and predicting whose um, child is gonna live longer. So we looked at the other thing that, that, again, globally is a picture of the overall health of a nation, and that's life expectancy. So just across the nation, the county at the time increased life expectancy just like everybody else. So it used to be around 70.6 um, years in 1990, had increased to about 75.4 years um, in 2010 on that data. 
But what's also apparent in our analysis was that there is both um, differences by sex and by racial groups so that there's a significant change or difference in life expectancy depending on if you are a black male um, versus a white female. And so again, we just generally map that data. The darkest colors are individuals with a life expectancy between 66 and 70, and the lighter color is a um, difference between 80 and 86. So we see some variability across the county, but just like infant mortality, we wanted to see statistically what made the difference. And what do you see here? Yeah, some of the same things we saw before. And in fact, there could be on average as much as a 20 year difference in life expectancy when you live in one of these blue areas um, of the census tract versus the red census tract here. So, so for the infant mortality and life expectancy data where we took the deeper dive in terms of statistics, there really does seem to be something here um, that leads us to believe that place matters for health. So the other context that I think it was really important for our team when we were doing this project um, or the study was to look at why, coming back to that question of why we might see some of the things that we have. And we wanted to take a look back. Um, again, this was a reflection over 50 years time. And, and the only thing that we found compelling about what was happening in the past and why we might see these differences, again, by residential area was um, zoning and planning. So um, in 19, the Birmingham 1926 zoning ordinance um, established the land use of racial and racial districts within the city. So basically this ordinance <laughs> told black people where they could live, um, where they could shop, where they can go and where they could. And so um, blacks in particular were prevented from living in certain neighborhoods. And this was not unlike um, most other larger um, cities in the Southeast. But what was different about this particular ordinance is the length of time in which it stayed on the books. So whereas Atlanta, Memphis, other places um, did away with their respective laws much sooner, it wasn't until 1951 when the U.S. Supreme Court struck down um, this particular ordinance in which it went off the books. But I think that there are others that sort of suggest that there still was sort of this um, policy or practice, if you will, to still keep some of those things in place. And one of the things that helped to contribute to keeping that ordinance in place had to do with um, the development of the interstate highway system and some urban renewal that was happening around that same time in the 1950s. And so what ended up happening was you know, um, plots of land, including where we all sit here, um, that were predominantly African-American were deemed to be um, ripe for urban renewal. And so those properties were then taken over. Um, those individuals were displaced to go other places. And then you have a rise of great institutions. I mean, certainly we've all benefited from that. Um, but what it ended up doing was essentially um, pushing people to certain and highly concentrating them in certain areas. Um, again, there's no evidence that there was a deliberate or intention um, in terms of the highway system or some of this urban renewal. But what we see is that some of the same places where people were pushed to live, um, they're still there. So you see that generations worth of um, population staying in those same places. So with all that said, you know, part of what I'm hoping to have convinced you at this point is that the context in which you're talking about working with diverse populations, particularly in the Deep South, um, there's a combination of racial influence, a context there, there's an income and economic influence. Um, there's also an influence around education and place. Um, and then also this is issue around history as well and what has happened. And um, for those of you who might recall, I think it was yesterday or the day before, um, even our former um, Congressman Jeff Sessions made a fairly controversial statement, I think, into the audience that he was in and talked about the, the way in which we have described um, the Civil War in the past has been about states' rights. Um, he came out and very strongly said it really wasn't about states' rights, it was about slavery. So if you think about all the context that we're having, we're talking about issues of um, you know, segregation and where people could and could not li live, um, all of these things play a role in terms of the communities that you may potentially be working in. 
So I lastly want to just give you a couple of tips and tools that have been helpful for me in my work that is primarily focused in um, African-American communities throughout the region, but also in rural communities um, within Alabama and Mississippi in particular. And the key for me is community engagement. And what I mean in terms of uh, community engagement or stakeholder engagement, um, stakeholders are all the people and groups that have a vested interest in a clinical research or health policy decision. So it's everybody um, has some stake in terms of what you might be focusing on in your translational research. The stakeholder engagement then is a process of giving voice to and involving those stakeholders in the effective healthcare related decision making and research. Um, and it serves the purpose of reciprocal learning and knowledge exchange to improve health. So it's not you intervening on someone or you researching someone, it is actually involving that, that individual, those groups in the process itself so that there's mutual and benefic um, mutually beneficial outcomes. And there's different levels of stakeholder engagement. Um, I sort of liken these to a plant, a tree, and a forest. So I think there's a piece of it where you, um, you can certainly just go out and get input and assistance on recruitment. And some people do that type of research. Um, it's really important. It's better than not doing that. If you want to go a step further in terms of this engagement, that's providing input actually into your research questions, your study design, and being a part of that active team member. And then the last part of that engagement, I think, is which is a lot of what I do, is community-based participatory research. And this is when you have a much more shared um, partnership um, between the academic partners, the community partners, and you adhere to about nine different principles of community-based participatory research, which includes starting with and respecting and valuing the community that you're in. So knowing that context in which you're going in and having representation of that community um, at the table at every phase of the research. So um, again, it's collaborative, it's equitable, um, it's, it's mutually beneficial. It is tough work to do. Um, I, I can definitely tell you um, it is not easy. It's also not a process that you can kind of come into um, one day and then you're out of it when the five-year grant is over. Um, these are relationships that are built over time. Trust is built up over time. Uh, but I have found them in my research to be um, quite um, rewarding. So how do you, um, just in general, whether or not you do CBPR or not, how do you get into these communities and how do you work and, and work um, to in, in a way that is beneficial? So first and foremost, I think you have to understand the local context. So I gave you some snippets in terms of things that were, re um, that were relevant to the work that I've done. Um, I think that's one way to sort of do your homework, look at the literature. The other way that's also, and I think probably more important, is to, with that community engagement, um, have the individuals themselves to help you to understand what they're seeing. So we each come to a situation with our own back, our own lens. So the, the red and the blue on the um, sunglasses there. So be, because of you know who I am, where I grew up, where I went to school and so forth, I see things um, quite differently than someone if they had a different experience. And so photo voice is a methodology that I've used a lot in my community projects that helps me to see things the way the people I'm trying to work with see them. So you literally give people cameras and you have them to go out. You give them a specific question to take pictures of and then you have them come back and describe that. So you have the photo and the voice sort of in the, the uh, focus group piece and talk about what they see and how it's relevant to your particular research question. It, it both helps the researcher in terms of learning the local context. Um, it gives the community a voice um, perspective, um, you know, that you may not have heard otherwise. And it may give you some clues to how you can be more innovative in the work that you're doing. Um, but it validates and it can be quite actionable in terms of once you see where the issues are, to have the community to come up with the solutions to the, um, to the problems that they see as opposed to, you know, we're the academics, we know what we're doing and just follow what we say. And so here's a couple of examples from some of our projects where we focus again a lot on nutrition and physical activity. So we had pictures where people talked about their physical environments um, around diet could include things like community gardens, um, farmers markets and farm stands. But at the same time, they included grocery stores where most of the meats were um, highly processed or they were very fatty um, or the only restaurants that were available were fast food restaurants. 
The same is true with physical activity. So people took um, pictures in their communities around physical activity environments. And so while there are some areas and communities that had nice sidewalks so people could walk um, or they had um, pools and other recreational facilities for people to go and get exercise, Others talked about, well, yeah, we have those things, um, but we have infrastructure problems. It, it um, you know, for example, one of the communities that we worked in in Mississippi, we we would cringe every time it would rain because that meant that most people could not cross um, the bridge or um, the street in which they needed to come to our community center for their assessments because there was so much flooding involved or the streets were not paved um, way, the way they needed to be. So again, getting us a picture before coming in to say, we're gonna do this program to understand what's happening on the ground. So the other thing that I think is really important in this kind of work is to figure out what's really culturally relevant. Um, and, um, and you do that by asking um, the population and getting to know and engaging in that community. And so for the work that we were doing, um, you know, we had to determine what was the most important thing. Did we need to approach and work through um, local churches? Um, other work has been done in barbershops and beauty salons. Um, some of it could be materials. Um, some of it could also be in the messaging and communication between patient and provider. Um, but you have to figure out what's going to resonate with that group that you're trying to um, work with. And then for us, we needed to make some cultural adaptation. So what we knew um, in terms of trying to get people to manage their weight was that there is a Southern dietary pattern. So fast foods and fats and fried foods and sweets and so forth were part of the natural culture. And it's very difficult to get into a community and tell people, we need you to totally change your culture. So we had to find ways to adapt our recipes, adapt what we were communicating to the population um, so that it was something that would resonate with them. They could still maintain that, that cultural pride and heritage uh, while still moving to a healthier um, option for that. And the same was true from physical activity. So we, you know, we're focusing on increasing physical activity. Um, but one of the things that we noted early on in some of our reformative work was that, you know, people weren't necessarily getting a lot of support from their family and friends when they were talking about making these changes. And so it was really important to make sure that the social support was there so that people didn't feel isolated when we were encouraging to do, them to do something. And in our studies that focus on women in particular, we had to look at the body image and those um, varying roles and thoughts about body image. Um, and those vary quite a bit in terms of our population, in terms of you know, trying to get to a specific size um, versus being healthy. And we had to make adjustments to that. And then certainly the built environment bar um, barriers that I mentioned before. So I think, you know, in sum, I think the key ingredients to working in diverse um, communities, particularly in translational type research, is um, some form of engagement. Again, I'm not advocating that you have to do CBPR, but you should, in fact, engage in some way with stakeholders that you're trying to address. Um, you have to find ways to better understand the lived experience of those individuals if you want to be successful in recruitment or in your interventions or get you know adherence and so forth. You've got to sort of see um, things from their point of view. And then there may be a need for cultural adaptation. Um, we focus a lot on evidence-based and translation is about taking something that's evidence-based in this area and moving it to another area. But even in that um, translation, we've got to make sure that we are um, making appropriate adaptation so that it reaches the audience, the new audience that we're trying to, um, to attract. And then what I personally found is that you've got to constantly review and keep up and look at these things. And there, there is a loop um, that is oftentimes not as comfortable in the way we've traditionally been told about doing research, that you just kind of, you have your plan, your protocol, and you just kind of move through until the end. Um, but there is a need sometimes to make adjustment, mid-course adjustments um, when things aren't working the way they need to be, and that flexibility is key. So with that, I'll take any questions um, anyone has or other observations. So for those of us who do human research, are there any resources or any collaborations that we could seek out uh, in order to know more minorities? Uh, or to improve yeah, uh, diversity? Yeah, so I, I, I came in on the tail end of the conversation from the, the, the first um, hour of the talk, and I think that um, 
part of it is broadening the um, the network of people that are a part of your investigative team. So I, I do believe that that's helpful. Um, I, and, and also doing that community engagement that I talked about. In addition, we have here at UAB, we have the Minority Health and Health Disparities Research Training Program, um, has a, uh, I think it's two year now training program that really focuses on and has a lot of um, seminars and didactic experience there. And then there are other um, individuals that I would certainly encourage you to reach out to, including myself. So I actually attended a meeting with Dr. Kensag where he yes. was reaching out to a community person who would go out to churches. Yes. How successful is that? So it, it, it um, largely depends on the person. Um, so I think it's not just simply finding someone off the street and say, hey, um, you person from this demographic go into this community. What we found successful in our um, projects within particularly cancer disparities is finding the right people, finding the people in the community who are trusted, not just the title trusted. So sometimes you can say, oh, you know, this person is the president of this organization or is the pastor of this church. Um, but you've got to dig down. And we, we talk, the way I talk about it is we were doing social networking before social networking became popular. Um, we were li literally having people to tell me who are the people that you go to in your community when you need to find out something. And what we did was we found what, what who were those names that kept popping up multiple times. And then we started approaching them about their interest in working with us. So um, our approach to a community health advisor model is one in which we bring in people who are natural leaders, who are passionate about this. Um, we give them training and then we send them out. So it is more than recruitment. Um, so you have sometimes community recruitment or outreach recruitment. Um, we're, we're talking about a much more intensive, um, connected experience. I'm curious how the data you presented um, in Jefferson County compares to other urban areas, um, specifically northern areas like Chicago or Washington, D.C. Um, and, you know, I've, I'm not a social scientist, but I've heard that, you know, income inequality is actually greater in those cities looking at south side Chicago or Montgomery County to Prince William County in D.C. So yeah. does that translate to health outcomes in those northern cities as well? Yes. So the, um, the Jefferson County Collaborative, which was formerly called Jefferson County Place Matters, is part of about 23 teams across the country. So there, there was a team in Chicago, a team in Baltimore, um, and in D.C. And so they, I believe, in all of those areas, they also had similar reports. Um, so the constant theme across, I think there were probably at least 10 or 11 reports that came out looking at um, these health equity issues. The constant theme across all of them was around neighborhood racial segregation. Um, and that is wrapped up into race, into income. It's all kind of convoluted. It's really difficult to tease apart. Um, you know, is it just income or is it just race? It's probably an intersection of all of those things. But certainly the patterns about, um, you know, differences in life expectancy, for example, were very similar in those same urban areas, even in the north and then also looking at other health outcomes as well. Um, with respect to that though, the problem with the racial set neighborhood segregation is that what happens is you have a high concentration, particularly in our county, where you saw race and income together, poverty together. You have a high concentration of individuals that live in poverty and that's problematic um, for them to be in a concentration versus being dispersed. And part of that has to do with, again, what are the resources that are available? So I think David Williams, who's a renowned speaker on um, and scientist related to disparities, um, you know, puts up this, this, these studies all the time and would say that a racial ethnic minority who is poor, who lives in a middle and upper income area, has much better outcomes than that individual living in high concentration of poverty all around them. And part of that is what are they, what do they have access to? So they're likely, even though they, that family doesn't have a lot of income, they live in an area where there is a grocery store, they live in an area where there's probably better transportation, better school systems, um, all those things that are part of those social determinants of health. So that even if you don't address the poverty, if you can increase the diversity in terms of where they live, um, you can improve their health outcomes. I think that was tried in Chicago when they tore down uh, Cabrini Green. I lived there briefly, um, lived in Chicago. They tore down that housing project 
and try to disperse people into other communities to even things out. But it was a lot of, um, it was very controversial. It was the attitude that those who were predominantly white and upper income, they did not want low income individuals living in their communities. Yeah, it's, it's not very easy to do. So there was a, um, a, a big shift in terms of housing vouchers that HUD did, I think around the 1970s, 80s. And while it was not set up to be a study looking at health outcomes, what they did find is for those families who got the vouchers to move into communities that were more wealthy, um, they had better health outcomes. So it wasn't set up that way, um, but essentially that's what happened. It's very difficult ethically to sort of randomize people to go to stay in this area or not, um, but that's some of the best evidence and it's been consistent over a couple of decades when they do follow up, that if you can disperse that um, poverty and not have it concentrated, that you end up with things that are, um, you know, individuals that have much better outcomes. So again, it goes back to, um, we need fabulous medical care, um, certainly need to, to continue that and address the disparities that are within medical care. But if we can attack and make sure that we don't have the disparities that we see in our educational system, our graduation rates, some of the housing and so forth, then I think we can also make a significant change in, our, in terms of our health. We've talked about how having members of the healthcare team who look like the populations they're trying to work with is really valuable. That's not always possible. Do you have a, are there any lessons learned about the kind of training that people can receive to help them be more effective at interacting with communities that are different from their own? So I think that the biggest training is sort of the home training. Um, so being respectful when you're going into a community and a place that you've never been in before, um, using your, um, you know, your, your ears to listen more than you talk. Um, and it's looking and getting folks um, to build those relationships so that they can have those candid conversations. I think that's the most important learning I think you could have and to you know, recognize and appreciate the limitations of your knowledge of a community. So I think going in and just being open and say, you know, even for, for me, for example, when I started working in um, rural areas in Alabama, Mississippi, part of the Deep South Network for Cancer Control, I'm a city girl. I'm from Atlanta. Um, yes, I am African-American. My father happened to have been born in Alabama, but I know nothing about the experience of living in a rural area. So I, too, had to listen much more than I taught in those first several months when I was getting to know that community. So I think, you know, without any formal programs, that's something each of us can do and do quite efficiently. And you'd be amazed at how um, how that's a different approach than most people are expected to. And that will start to build those relationships. I think the other thing is, again, recognizing the limitations of your skill set. And so finding that person, um, maybe they're not part of your team, maybe they're not in the right field or the right science background, um, but having a candid conversation saying, hey, I'm, I'm working on this area, working this population, help me out. Um, so I've certainly had colleagues to say, I don't know how to even begin to think about this. So I think that's there. Um, the health disparities training program, I think, is great. Um, there's also the NRM in network, um, which is also looking at and has webinars and things like that that you can get involved in. Um, the office, the Federal Office of Minority Health has lots of chart books and data to sort of give you a better impression of what's going on. Um, even the World Health Organization document that I mentioned talks about things structurally across country. Um, but I think there, there is a growing amount of research that's out there but I can't stress enough about the personal interaction and that, at least for me, has been the most powerful training tool. Not, not to be this um, defeatist about it, but I, I'm incredibly impressed with how long it can take to build trust. That's yes. true trust and yes. how easy it is to disrupt yes. a relationship yes. of trust. Yes. Um, I'm just, uh, how many of you are familiar with what NRMN means? Um, so this is, you, sh you should look into it. This is the National Research Mentoring Network. Um, UAB is um, part of the network in a significant way. The, the NRMN is a um, national organization that's funded by NIH, yes. partly at least, mm -hmm. um, but right. set up to improve access to mentoring for people around the country. It 
has an emphasis, but it's not exclusively for mentees who are from underrepresented minority groups, but it's, uh, it's a, I think it's not exclusive at all. Um, you can sign up to be a mentor um, online. You get some training that's actually pretty useful. Um, and you get, um, you sort of have to wait for a mentee to choose you, which can be frustrating and can take a while, but it's really an opportunity to get, uh, to sort of stretch your wings and try to be a mentor, uh, learn about other communities and uh, offer to give back a little bit in settings where you have some skills to, to share with other people. So I encourage you to take a look at it. You can sign up um, at really, uh, I, mean, I don't think you can sign up as an undergraduate to be a mentor, but you don't need to be a great parent person to be a mentor at all. I just want to add to what you said, Dr. Chaplin. NRMN currently has a matchmaking initiative taking place uh, this week. I don't know how long it will last, but they're trying to match mentees and mentors. Right. But I think it goes on all the time. Um, and it's been in the works for, I don't know, more than five years, and it's a, a substantial program. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. I just realized, thank you so much. I trust what I can do. I forgot to mention one thing. I'm sorry, from as you're leaving. So one of the people who is in our online community has had some experience with something called the Undiagnosed Disease Network that is run out of UAB that is a sort of a combined um, clinical, largely clinical, but it has a research component. And in that group, uh, history information, the informed consent that's offered is, has a either 10 or 15 year expiration. So that it's certainly possible in the kind of studies that um, we talked about for the Alabama Genomic Health Initiative to put an end point to the um, validity of the informed consent process so that you can um, set it up so that 10 years down the road, anything you promise to do in your as a research participant is then ended and dissolved and that you're able to come back to you or at least they're no longer available to other people. So there are experiences where that happens and it'll be interesting to see how those kind of groups, how it ends up comparing between them and the uh, broader consent that the General Health Initiative is coming out. Thank you. Thanks. Great talk. You know, the camp, I think it was colon cancer and breast cancer. I can't remember. I was moonlighting all over the place. Do you want me to say? Yeah, if you don't mind putting it on the desktop, then I'll just um, ask Jean to pick it up off the desktop. That would be great. I hope she doesn't Thank have to do it. Thank you so much for your business. Oh, she's good. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, mean, I was uh, down in Tuscaloosa in my doctor program, and I described the focus groups for the NCI mm -hmm. down in Mississippi yeah. and in Alabama. And I think the group was born cancer screening, and then the American one called breast cancer. Yeah. I can't remember. I was just. <laughs> yeah, so I was um, transferred. I'm trying to make a living. We were quite disappointed that uh, NCI decided not to fund the network partners grant any longer mm -hmm. after saying they were effective. Yes, yes. So they've gone to some a different kind of model now. So um, mm -hmm. but we're still trying to talk so now uh, Dr. Partridge retired last mm -hmm. summer. So mm -hmm. um, we've been trying to work with Claudia and Hardy and wow. trying to find a way to kind of maintain the network we've had there for quite like yeah, seventy years. Yeah. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah. You know, um, you know, for great work, and I'm glad to finally have met yeah, you. I yeah. think we may have talked. I don't know, but I know I was the, tra the transcriptionist for the Thank you. Well, that was a great lecture. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm from Michigan, actually. I was in Detroit for quite some time. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so I'm wondering if you know anything about all the renovations they're doing to the city, because I know I just left a couple of years ago. So I don't know a whole lot, but actually, so I'm also part of the Robert Wood Johnson Cultural Health Leaders Program, and oh, like the um, 
one of our colleagues, Kent Key, is from Detroit. He's actually going to be here tomorrow on campus doing a talk and talking about the Flint water crisis and um, some of the Flint too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So he's going to be talking a lot about that and disparities. But um, but yeah, there is a there's a, a Detroit team that's part of that national collaborative, and they also had a report where they talked about all the different disparities and what's going on. Um, and, you know, it, it is really tough. I mean, even here, it's tough to kind of get action. Um, you know, when I do these presentations in different groups, people have to say, well, what do you want us to do? You know, you mean you want us to give all the money away to this group? And so it's a really hard political conversation to have. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. Because they're, they're putting mil like billions of dollars yep. into Detroit. Yeah. Like when I was there, school, so last year was supposed to be the end of the first phase. Okay. But they were, as a, when I was a resident sure. there, they were giving incentives. To yeah. the physicians to live downtown, and so like if you the, lived in Detroit. And so the challenge with that is, which is kind of something that played out uh, and it probably paid out in the the change of mayors um, in Birmingham, was yes, this fear around gentrification. So who are people trying to attract, um, and who was being displaced again um, from those communities? And and that's a hard conversation that not a lot of people are really willing to have. Um, and so when you talk about grocery stores coming into communities, I mean, their biggest yeah. argument is um, there's going to be theft or the, the incomes of the people who live in the area can't support, you know, sustaining us to get a profit. So it's not, you know, evil people saying, yeah, I want these people to be bad or whatever, you know, that's, that's not what's going on. I mean, they're looking at it from an economic standpoint. So then you have communities, um, municipalities that they will provide incentives. Um, to go in certain places, and then it, when those incentives wear off, so we've seen closures of, you know, Sam's and Walmart's in certain mm -hmm. areas where they had right. incentives, they, and they, then those were stopping too. Correct, because the incentives been going on, on for a few years. Yes, but the incentives have gone on, 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 and the neighborhood has not caught up, and so they they pulled the plug. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, they were waiting, I think, because the Whole Foods went in while I was there as, okay. a, as a medical student. They put yeah. their first grocery store oh, yeah. in downtown Detroit. Yeah. It was Whole Foods. Yeah. And that's still there. And then Whole when I was, check. When yeah. I was yeah. a resident, yeah. they put a Meyer, yeah. which is like yeah. a. Yeah. 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 They put it, well, eight miles. So they okay. put it right on the border. It was technically Shoot. Detroit, but it was like Ferndale, yeah. like right across yeah. the street. Yeah. Yeah. But that. You know, I, I grew up in uh, New York City, and but my father's from the South, so he moved to the South. So most of my life, I've been in the South, but I was educated in the North and South. So I have a dual perspective. And every time I, I move into an area, it's so stark for me. The disparity, it just smacks me uh, uh, literally upside my face, and I see it in Detroit. I see it half now because I'm still trying to decide where I'm going to live. And I've mm -hmm. moved a lot in Birmingham mm -hmm. in the course of three years. Yeah. Yeah. Tuscaloosa, it was easy. Yeah. So I'm not. I'm very particular about where I'm going to buy and mm -hmm. where my wife and I decide what we're going to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And it is the lines are clear. But downtown, I thought, you know, I'll get in the park downtown so I could walk my dog doing lunch at $2,200 yes. for 700 square feet. Yes. Yeah. I can have a you mansion thought. for $2,200 yeah. a Not month. That's a mortgage. Yes. Right. Yes. So who are they trying? They don't want me down here. And I have a PhD. 